Welcome to Black Market, a solo exhibition by Andrzej Szkupca. I'm Angels Miralda, the curator of this exhibition, and I'm making this digital recording because I can't physically be with you in the exhibition. Firstly, I'd like to say that this project has been realized in what turned out to be a context that's made it very prescient. Before the lockdown, working with Schkupz on the exhibition, we discussed many aspects of dystopia, science fiction, and contemporary theory that very often navigated predictions of collapse. The future in its very nature is unpredictable, and therefore thinking about it usually puts you in one of two camps, that of utopia or dystopia. The context for this exhibition changed virtually overnight. On the eve of the original opening, something so unimaginable in our previous lives happened on a global level. The questions posed in this exhibition no longer feel as distant as they did before. The uncertain and terrifying future is not an abstract thought, but a moment that feels to be upon us. Schkupz's work falls somewhere between the utopian and dystopian. In the exhibition, which is a narrative circuit, you will find a world of futuricity of materials, life, evolution, technology, which all combine to propose possible narratives. Most importantly, they assert not the possibility, but the inevitability of the future. The future is unavoidable, and if we don't embrace it and create it, it will catch us by surprise. In terms of the exhibition, I'll start from the beginning. Black Market is a project that Shkuksa has been working on for a very long time. It's already taken on several modular iterations. Portions of this project have been presented at Futurist Carlin Studios in Prague and at the GMK in Zagreb. For the MGLC, these models are meant to unite to produce not just one room or a sample of the material, but a progressive community that plays with progress, modularity, and physical constriction. In the first room, you will find a very minimal space with pages of a glossary. I chose to introduce this exhibition with this type of manual or guide as a sort of survival kit of vocabulary to think through the exhibition that follows. This is a list of materials, concepts, and references that build a rough context for the exhibition. For me, as a curator, Schwuchza's work is interesting in that at first glance it is an extremely global concern. It's tied deeply with the forefront of theory and technology in international research centers. However, there is a distinct lineage that comes directly from Ljubljana, and that follows through with a lot of the local discourse of the city. This is why you will find a format in these entries that often explain a theory as briefly and concisely as possible, and then connect it either with a Slovenian artist or with an artwork that has been prominently exhibited in Ljubljana. This is also a small reference to the family tree of Neue Slovenische Kunst that traced an art historical lineage ending with Erwin, who just happens to be one of Schutz's own references. The MGLC as a setting is also a perfect place for such a project, as it's a reference for the balance between globalism and localism as the seat of the biennial of graphic arts. This glossary in the first room is open-ended and incomplete. Every encyclopedia is incomplete because it's impossible to record everything. And this one is specifically left as just a jot of a couple of notes that I thought were most important. But it's open for you to think as you go through the exhibition of other terms that are missing. It could expand infinitely, finding more and more interesting terms to define. So although due to the unfortunate circumstances, I'm not able to be physically present at the exhibition, the rooms are meant to be traversed as slowly as possible. Each iteration of the work shows slight changes that contribute to an arching narrative. Pay attention to the reflections, the gloss, and the material that makes these arching forms. A couple of months ago, I sent a series of photographs to Schkupca of the famous sculptures of spiders by Louise Bourgeois. Schkupca's techno-animals are not recognizably critters, but they represent an amalgamation between animal and machine. Both his and bourgeois sculptures inspire a, fearing, a feeling of horror. The sculptures are larger than the human body, and they become a physical cage. The physical constraints border every room, so they transform from exhibition spaces into escape pods.
The sculptures guide your path through the exhibition halls, asking you to physically respond. These physical constraints are parallel to the very material nature of this project. Rooted in theory which lives outside of physical reality, Schuft's project is really an embodiment and a sensation that can complement these words. I'll start with a few material entries from the glossary that come in handy to think about this strange and curious materiality. For instance, ballistic gelatin is characterized as a less stable version of silicone. It is a testing medium that was developed to simulate human muscle tissue. Due to its similarity to animal and human tissues, it has begun to be used widely in the field of terminal ballistics and crash test dummies that are today replete with full abdomens and organ simulacra. It acquires other properties similar to living tissue, including the gelatinous character of the material and water solubility. It can be mixed in various concentrations to achieve different effects. Try to locate this material in the works. The relation with the spectator, with the material of our own body, echoes in the techno corpus of Scruza's works. Now we'll look at a different material. Polyurethane. Polyurethanes are formed by reacting a polyol, an alcohol with more than two reactive hydroxyl groups per molecule, with a disocyanate or a polymeric isocyanate in the presence of suitable catalysts and additives. Because a variety of disocyanates and a wide range of polyols can be used to produce polyurethane, a broad spectrum of materials can be produced to meet the needs of specific applications. Versatility, adaptivity, diversity of application. These materials share survival strategies with animal species. From these material parallels to evolutionary traits, we can jump to scientific theories and entries such as Autonomous material systems is a form of engineering that is inspired by biological systems. Using cell structures and organic matter's ability to heal, synthetic polymers are being developed to mimic behaviors of living tissues. An example can be microcapillary systems that combat structural problems of aging polymers. Some of the leading causes of engineering failure and obsolescence are due to cracks produced deep within the material in locations that are impossible to monitor. Microcapillary systems involve the production of polymers with a network of synthetic blood vessels that spill healing agent inside of cracks deep within the polymer substance in order to bond the crack faces and increase the life expectancy of synthetic structures. This methodology of material research is sometimes termed as biomimicry and attempts to reconstruct organic tissue's ability to self-repair, self-organize, and self-replicate without the need for a project manager. Disciplines like biotech assert that our future is deeply rooted in our past. There are still effects of small genetic traces that we cannot understand about ourselves. But what is clear is that life has an astounding ability to survive even the worst catastrophe. This is how black market lies between fatalism and hope. As we proceed through the rooms, we might wonder where these creatures come from, what purpose they originally served, and what world they inhabit. Here, the connection with futuristic thinking and science fiction, as well as horror genres, create the demand to imagine all of these possibilities on your own. White covers the rooms from floor to ceiling, creating a horror of AQI. One entry in the glossary gives the example of one form of historical futuristic thinking. Cosmism a philosophy that emerged at the end of the 19th century in Russia. It engaged in speculative futurology and planetology. It was one of the movements that proposed a goal for the human species aligned with utopian principles of radical equality, ecology, community, and immortality. Nikolai Fyodorovich Fyodorov was one of the proponents of focusing scientific energy into achieving immortality, after which the next goal would involve the resurrection of all humans who have passed away. The Cosmos group was also composed of rocket scientists such as Nikolai Kibalchish, who was a proponent of space colonization as a means to perfect humankind. Cosmist ideas ranged from the nihilistic understanding of all organic matter as evidence of death to ways of overcoming it. Eating animals and plants was considered to be part of the cycle of death. 
Thus, scientists proposed to bioengineer humans to perform photosynthesis for self-sustainability. Once all human ancestors had been resuscitated, planets would be adapted to their environmental needs, i.e. one planet would recreate the ancient Egyptian world, while another would recreate the Enlightenment, so that every ancestor would live peacefully in the worlds they once knew. Recently, cosmist ideas have been central in contemporary art discourse. Russian artist Anton Vidokol's 2015 film The Communist Revolution Was Caused by the Sun recounts the cosmist utopias that inspired the Soviet Union. This entry shows how science fiction is connected to reality, how the fictional environments we imagine, the goals that we set, influence our world. Science fiction is also an excellent genre from which criticism can be formed for the present. Problems in current society can be addressed through horror and emotion in order to set up examples of what could occur. Several science fiction writers have been formative in Schultz's thought and have become recurring references in recent theory. Crash is a novel by J.G. Ballard, published in 1973. It is a written exploration of symphorophilia, which is the symptom of sexual arousal from witnessing a tragedy such as a car crash, otherwise called car crash sexual fetishism. The main character is Dr. Robert Vaughn, a former TV scientist who is fixated on recreating the car crashes of celebrities. It is revealed that his fantasy is to die in a head-on collision with the famous actress Elizabeth Taylor. The novel, today considered one of Ballard's most important, characterizes his view of the future, both dreadful and exciting, a point where dystopia and utopia converge. As you reach the last room in the exhibition, you will find the exhibition's catalogue. It is full of texts that combine the themes and theories present in the exhibition and add multiple voices from the authors who have contributed. The catalogue is an integral part of the exhibition because theory is an anchor for Schutz's material manifestations. If anything, they serve as a physical alternative to text. The exhibition was originally meant to remind us of the certainty of an impending disaster. A civilizational crash that was meant to occur. Now that such a catastrophe has fallen upon us and we slowly are trying to emerge, I don't think that this message no longer holds sway. In fact, because a virus has reached us first does not diminish the constant threat of climate disruption, monetary collapse, abuse of surveillance technology, or the ongoing ethical debate about singularity. So if the original warning has now come to pass, the exhibition takes on a second phase, the reminder of the constant threats which our communities are exposed to and to which we must respond by reimagining the future in radical ways. <laughs>